Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hello, listener. Do you like folk tales? Have you heard the one about the Little Mermaid? You have? Hmm. How about Little Red Riding Hood? Oh, you heard that one too. Well, how about you come along to Sandman Stories Presents? On Sandman, you'll learn the stories of Sulambara and Gulambara from Georgia. You'll hear stories of Anansi and his son Kwekutsin from Ghana. You'll hear stories from Korea, Japan, Nigeria, South Africa, Louisiana, the Philippines, Bengal, and many, many more. All over a sound bed of natural noises designed to calm your busy mind after a long day. So come along for an adventure, meet new places and people, and I won't be mad if you fall asleep and need to rewind and listen again the next day. Again, that's Sandman Stories Presents, anywhere you find podcasts. Thank you, and good night. Hey there, this is my disclaimer. I like to drop foul language. If you're someone who cringes at swear words, you've been warned. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. Well, only three more holidays to get through alone. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. I got this! It means it's time to burrow up like a big old bear in the winter and throw myself into cases and continue working on some exciting new things coming for Dark Cats Network in the new year. If you remember, last year I was moving and I missed podcasting all of November. This year, I'm here with you! And hopefully next year, my daughter and her boyfriend will be living here with me. Fingers crossed! And actually, I got a phone call from her yesterday, and she said her and her boyfriend for sure are coming here to live with me once their lease is up in June. I'm so excited! I'll get to celebrate holidays again and my birthday with people I know and love. Anyway, that's some of my exciting news. Find me on the socials. I'm Rainbow Crimes almost everywhere. With that, let's get into the case. Unless you're a baby boomer or older, you probably won't recognize the name of actor Sal Mineo. But if I tell you he was one of the stars alongside actor James Dean and actress Natalie Wood in Rebel Without a Cause from the 1950s, those are some names you might know. Sal was an open bisexual man and one of the very first in the movie industry to come out as LGBTQ+. Sal was of Sicilian descent, and he was born a Capricorn on January 10, 1939 in Harlem, New York. He grew up in the Bronx. As a very young kid, he was running with a tough Bronx street gang. Because of his bad, tough guy behavior, he was thrown out of his Catholic school when he was eight. When he was nine, he was arrested for robbery. Sal was given the choice of spending time in juvenile correction or going to professional acting school. What a choice, right? For me, it's like being given the choice of algebra or art. So his mom enrolled him in acting and dance classes. Surprisingly, tough guy Sal ended up loving both. He started to do live theater, and he excelled in it. He played a young prince in Yule Brenner's The King and I. His breakthrough screen role was playing gay teen John Plato Crawford, who was smitten with James Dean's character in Rebel Without a Cause. It was a groundbreaking role for Hollywood having an actor play a gay character. Although they never came right out and said it, the character Sal played was subtly gay. The movie Rebel Without a Cause is said to have been cursed because all three of the main stars ended up dead and not from natural causes. James Dean died due to a devastating car accident. Natalie Wood allegedly was killed by her husband, Robert Wagner. In Sal Minio, he was murdered. Another tidbit from the movie Rebel Without a Cause, the director of the movie was Nicholas Ray, 
he was a self-proclaimed bisexual man. It was rumored that he and Sal had sex away from the set at Sal's tender age of 16. It seems Hollywood pedophiles and casting couch piranhas, they were around a long time before the Me Too movement. In the last couple of tidbits, Sal was nominated for an Academy Award as Best Supporting Actor for his role in Rebel Without a Cause, and he also briefly dated Natalie Wood. By now, Sal was living in Hollywood, California. I'm not really sure if his whole family moved or what the deal was, but I kind of assume that the whole family moved from the Bronx to Southern California, because Sal's siblings also have been listed as actors. It would seem, though, their brother Sal, he was the one that had the most successful acting career of the whole family. Sal had booked and filmed two other movies the very same year he made Rebel Without a Cause in 1955. The following year, Sal booked and filmed three more movies. After that, he pretty much picked up steady work for the rest of the decade. Sal also started a recording artist career, and he had a couple of top 40 hits, including Lasting Love and Start Moving. He earned another Academy Award nomination in the early 60s for the movie Exodus. During the filming of Exodus, a 20-year-old Sal met 15-year-old English-born actress Jill Haworth, and the two had an on-again, off-again relationship. Sal even took Jill's virginity. Sal and Jill really did love each other, maybe more as friends. They did have a short-lived engagement. In 1965, Sal starred as a stalker in a low-budget thriller called Who Killed Teddy Bear? I watched it. It wasn't all that great. Pretty much gone were Sal's boyish good looks of the 50s. He was now being cast as a crazy, psychotic murderer. Possibly because Sal was open about his bisexuality, his acting career started to taper off in the mid-60s. Coincidence? Not likely, as even Hollywood, with all the free love, hippie mentality, it was rampant with homophobia. Now, California has always been known as an extremely liberal state. Still, homosexuality and bisexuality, it didn't become legalized in California until 1976. Sal had once commented, after divulging that he was bisexual to the magazine, One minute, I have more movie offers than I could handle. The next, no one wanted me. Sal became a struggling artist. He was able to land a few small parts here and there in the movies or on a television series, but his debt started to pile up. Sal was starting to get desperate. He ended up camping out on director Francis Ford Coppola's front yard to try and campaign for a role in the movie The Godfather. He devastatingly did not get a part. So Sal turned back to his old pastime, live theater. He dabbled in directing plays in which he also starred in. In 1970, he met and fell in love with Courtney Burr. The two started a long-term relationship. Okay, don't be confused by the name. Courtney Burr was a male actor. In 1971... Sal turned back to the theater to produce and star in a gay-themed play called Fortune in Men's Eyes. At that time, a very young Don Johnson from Miami Vice fame, he starred opposite of Sal. Then, for a few years, things kind of petered out for Sal's career. That is, until he landed a role as a bisexual burglar in the stage comedy P.S. Your Cat is Dead and he was slated to direct a new movie for MGM. Things were actually starting to look up during the latter part of 1975. Then on February 12, 1976, a now 37-year-old Sal was arriving home after play rehearsal. He parked his new 76 Duster in the carport of his apartment complex in West Hollywood. He got out, and he started to walk to his apartment through an alleyway. Sal saw someone approaching him with a knife, and he screamed, Oh my God! Help! 
Help me, please. Help me, please. He was jumped by the person and stabbed directly in his heart with a knife. Neighbors heard Sal's screams. They heard footsteps running away. Neighbors went downstairs in the alley to see if they could help the screaming man. Other neighbors called for the police. Sal was pronounced dead on the scene. He still had $21 in his pocket and his car keys. Two eyewitness neighbors described the killer as a white man with long brown hair. He was about 5'10 with a slender build. When police went upstairs to investigate Sal's apartment, they found gay men's magazines and leather pants. Immediately, they determined Sal's death was a hate crime. They ruled out robbery because he still had money and keys on him. But a gay hate crime? Really? This is so unlike the police of today who were very hesitant to call a clear-cut hate crime a hate crime. The murder of Sal Minio went cold for two years. Then in a prison in Michigan, a 23-year-old black inmate named Lionel Williams was bragging to another inmate. He said he was the one that killed Sal Minio. Later, he said he made it up. Lionel was serving time for writing bad checks in Michigan. Backing the murder story up was Lionel's wife in Los Angeles. She was saying the night Sal Minio was killed, her husband came home with blood on his shirt. Lionel was a pizza delivery guy at the time, and he had been committing nonviolent robberies in the area that Sal lived. Because of the testimony from his wife and his jailhouse confession, Lionel was convicted, and he was given a 51-year-to-life sentence. After serving 12 years, Lionel was released on probation in 1990. But prison did not deter Lionel from his robbery problem. He was back in and out of prison for more robberies. Okay, so we know Lionel was not a good dude, and he made some very bad choices. Although none prior or after Sal's murder seemed to involve violence or murder. My question is this. What happened to not one, but two witnesses seeing a white man with long brown hair? Could the long brown-haired man been a woman? Lionel Williams is a black man and had a black afro back then. One article said police were able to find a picture of Lionel with his hair dyed brown, and it was straightened and appeared long. <laughs> yeah, sure they did. But the elephant in the room... Lionel has dark skin. He's not white. The medical examiner made a cast of Sal's knife wounds, and Lionel's wife said, Yeah, that's from his knife. Oh my gosh, so it sounded like Lionel had done his wife wrong, and she starts to say things that the police want to hear. But is it all fabricated? Why did she not come forward the night Sal was killed if Lionel came home with a bloody shirt? Could it have been pizza sauce? He was a pizza delivery boy. I don't have the answers, but it does kind of sound like a setup and wrongful conviction to me. Lionel's a burglar, a robber, a thief, but a murderer? Inmates brag all the time about shit to sound like badasses. Other prisoners rat out those who confess to him for lighter sentences. I know Lionel served some time for Sal's murder and was released, but I'm not so sure he's the real killer. If his motive was to rob Sal, why not at least take his wallet and keys? It didn't sound like Sal was the victim of a robbery either. But unfortunately, I have to leave it there because there's really nothing else to go on, especially in the eyes of the law. The physical evidence was pretty much destroyed at the crime scene with the neighbors trying to help Sal. They were touching him and stepping all over the blood and around his body. The police thought they had their man with Lionel Williams. Lionel was tried and sentenced for the crime. The case is closed. But as far as I'm concerned, the murder of Sal is unsolved and was shoddily investigated. 
Hey there, it's Audrey, producer at Spike and Crown Studios. Now's your chance to support a 3D animated horror film and get some awesome rewards in return. Check out spikeandcrown.com and visit our Kickstarter to make a pledge. You'll get our cutest dog, Sancho, the heroic basset hound, in full plush form. He's super cuddly, has a magnet nose, and comes with a real pet collar. Best of all, you can get producer credit, limited edition trading pins, digital collectibles, and much, much more. Check us out at spikeandcrown.com. That's S-P-I-K-E-A-N-D-C-R-O-W-N. There's a link at the top so you can visit our Kickstarter page, watch the trailer, claim these amazing rewards, and become a horror film producer. Isn't that cool? Once again, it's spikeandcrown.com, and we're live on Kickstarter. A very similar case occurred in Hollywood a year later, to the day that Sal Minio was killed. This victim was an actress named Krista Helms. I'm going to tell you about Krista and how she was murdered, but first I'd like to cover her background story and give you some information into her life. This case was suggested by my expert researcher and case suggester, Nate. Thanks, Nate. It would appear Krista was bisexual, but possibly didn't realize it until the 70s when she moved to Los Angeles. Krista was a very sexual being pretty much all of her life. She was a Scorpio, so of course she was. And after all, in the 70s, Krista was in her 20s. It was the age of burning bras, women's liberation, girl power, and a time when women embraced their sexuality without feeling like a hoe. Krista Helms was born as Sandra Lynn Wolfale in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. As I said, she was a Scorpio. Her birth date, November 11, 1949. Her dad worked for an asphalt company, and her mom was a stay-at-home mom with an alcohol problem. Her mom's alcohol issues caused a lot of conflict between her mom and dad, and they ended up divorcing when Krista was only three years old. Krista and her siblings stayed with their mom until the alcoholism became unbearable, and then they went to live with their dad and his new wife. Growing up, Krista was afflicted with scoliosis, but that didn't slow her down any. She was filled with determination and drive. She wanted so badly to make something of herself, but at the age of 16, or possibly 17, there's been conflicting reports on this, she found herself pregnant by a 34-year-old man who owned a karate school that she attended. Not long after finding out she was pregnant, the karate school owner married Krista. He decided to do the right thing now and be a stand-up kind of guy, only to leave Krista the very next day after their wedding. Krista gave birth to a healthy little girl that she named Nicole who, as she got older, Krista told Nicole that her daddy had died in a motorcycle accident. Can't say I blame her. That dude was a prick. Krista now had a new goal, to give her daughter and herself the best possible life she could. Wanting to pursue acting, Krista moved to New York City. Having a child didn't deter Krista's incredible focus and motivation from wanting to succeed big in life. She actually found a woman in Vermont who cared for both the elderly and children. She set up an arrangement where Nicole could live with this woman and Krista would visit Nicole as often as possible. Then Krista set her sights on finding work in New York City. She found some modeling work that helped to pay the bills, and she rubbed elbows with the elite. She also pursued sugar daddies who would help pay for her apartment and other gifts. Krista did make a deal with herself. Once Nicole turned 10 years old, she would send for her and have Nicole live with her. Nicole missed her mom very much, and she could hardly wait until she turned 10 years old. Krista wasn't just living in New York City. She was actually living in the posh Manhattan section. And that's when she met a producer named Stuart Duncan. Stuart became her primary financial supporter. He had the money, too. His family were the owners of Lee and Perrin Worcestershire Sauce Company. That's a very hard word to say, by the way. Worcestershire? Worcestershire? 
You try it. I'm sure you're going to be better at it than I am. Although Stuart had no problem with the fortune his family was making through their company, he had no intention of working the family business. His dreams and desires were much loftier than that. He wanted to be part of the stage and screen, and so he was. Stuart convinced Krista to be part of his next play production. It was Godspell. She accepted and made a good amount of money from it. Krista also made friends with a clothing designer named Lenny Barron. Lenny could get Krista into any club in New York City, and he introduced her to many significant players in the stage and film industry. This was a huge step in the door for Krista. She was now hanging out with very influential people. It's important to know at this time, Krista kept a journal of everyone she slept with, and she also had a rating scoring of how good the partner was in the sack. She and her best female friend in high school started this ritual, and Krista kept it up into her adult years. Soon, several other people close to Krista, including Lenny, had knowledge of this diary. Pin that there, and we'll get back to it later, as the diary could play a very important part of why Krista was murdered. One night in New York City, Krista was hanging out with Lenny and his friend Kent. The three of them schemed a low-budget horror movie and how to get Krista's sugar daddy Stuart to finance it. Their plan worked, and soon Krista was starring in this movie called Let's Go for Broke. The film turned out to be more of an adventure film, and one of the locations was shot in Haiti. Basically, it was about a group of girls kidnapped and taken to an island. And Krista was one of these girls, but she ends up rescuing them all. I believe she was a spy or something like that named Jackie Broke. Definitely the movie was not Academy Award worthy, but it debuted Krista as the star, and this budget film started to cost $700,000, and then by the time it was done, it cost well over a million. This wasn't Krista's first movie she was in. She actually appeared in a scary movie about a cult called The Legacy of Satan. It wasn't a starring role. In fact, IMDb has her listed as The Blonde. Much of this movie was filmed in Krista's New York apartment. And in eerie irony, her character was stabbed to death at the end of the movie. During the filming of one of the movies, Krista found herself in the hospital because she injured her back on set. Remember, as a child, I told you she had scoliosis? And her back wasn't that strong to begin with. She ended up in traction in the hospital for a while. But while she was there, she started a fling with a famous football star at the time. Some of you might have heard of him. Broadway Joe Namath. He was the New York Jets quarterback. He too was in the hospital, but for his shoulder. Krista and Joe really enjoyed each other. And they'd have wheelchair races up and down the hallways of the hospital. Shortly after her hospital stint was over, Krista began a relationship with a music composer, also producer, named Joel Diamond. He encouraged her to record a song for one of the movies she was in. By now, it was the mid-70s. Krista was ready to move to Hollywood, California, where all the big movies and stars were. Yes, she was moving much further from her daughter, who was still in Vermont. But Krista knew for her career, it was a move she had to make. Krista's friend Lenny was also making the move to the Los Angeles area. Her sugar daddy put her up in a lavishly furnished home there. Lenny promised Krista he would introduce her to people who would propel her career even further. Krista only lived temporarily in the house financed by Stuart. Not sure if maybe she tired of being kept by him or they had a falling out, but it seemed like Stuart was no longer going to fund Krista's quest for stardom. She found herself a two-story loft, called it the Red House, because its primary interior design was decorated in reds. Then Krista took a roommate, a woman named Patty Collins. Krista scored a bit part on an episode of Starsky and Hutch, and then a bigger role on the Wonder Woman television series. Her date book started filling up with celebrities as well. 
She started adding more and more names and rankings to her journal. Actors Warren Beatty, James Caan, Burt Reynolds, golfer Jack Nicholson, rocker Mick Jagger were all famous names in Krista's journal. Along with her journal, Krista also used audio cassette to record some of her sexual romps. Now, I just gave you a short list of a long list of famous names that were in her journal. Krista and Patty were not just roommates. They actually started a sexual relationship together. They even engaged in a threesome with a famous male celebrity. Do you want me to tell you who it was? Okay. It was actor George Hamilton. He was pretty famous for the movie Zorro and Love Bites. He noticed when he was with the two women that Patty seemed a little perturbed he was there. After the threesome, though, Krista and Patty turned up their relationship. And even though the women were in a relationship together, occasionally they would each bring men home for sex. Quite often, the men would be band members that they met together. Eventually, Patty would move out of the Red House. But the sexual relationship between the two women continued albeit it was a complicated relationship. One of those, had they been on Facebook back then, they would have checked, in a relationship, but it's complicated. Patty was a backup singer on a new disco album Krista was recording, but the women's relationship grew very heated, and this was due to Patty's becoming jealous over Krista's male conquests. Krista was now desperately trying to get out of the relationship with Patty. She even booted Patty off her new album. Then Krista became involved with a male musical artist named Blair Aronson. One night when Krista and Blair were bumping uglies, another musical artist, a woman named Debbie Danilo, who was obsessed with Blair, stood outside Blair's window, and she angrily watched Krista and Blair have sex. Debbie claimed that Krista had even propositioned her to have sex. But Debbie wasn't interested. Debbie also denied having the hots for Blair, which I questioned because why else was she lurking outside his bedroom window? Twenty-four hours after Krista and Blair were together having sex and being witnessed doing it by Debbie, Krista was dead. On February 12, 1977, again exactly one year after Sal Minio's murder, In the same neighborhood Sal Minio lived, Krista was attacked and stabbed multiple times in what appeared to be a crime of passion. Police immediately thought her murder and Sal's were somehow connected due to the coincidences of location, the date of the crime, and the method of murder. Those who knew of Krista's journal and audio tapes told the police to look for them. But there was a huge problem. The journal and the tapes, they disappeared. Friends like Lenny began to list people they knew were in Krista's journal. All of the celebrities I mentioned were questioned. And actor George Hamilton, he was on the suspect list, as was singer Debbie Danilo. Also a huge suspect because she disappeared after Krista's murder and still cannot be found to this day was Krista's former roommate and lover, Patty Collins. I have to say, her disappearing off the face of the earth, that's pretty fucking suspicious. To this day, Krista's killer has never been caught, and Krista may never receive unicorn justice. If you see Patty Collins, tell her she has a few people who want to ask her some questions. Rest in power, Sal and Krista. Also, I want to thank my friend Dustin from Sandman Stories for portraying the voice of Sal Minio for me. Thanks, Dustin, and be sure to check out Sandman Stories. He does such a great job with stories from all over the world. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. Beyond the Rainbow was selected to be in the very first podcast calendar. I'm so excited! My show will represent Pride Month, and I will be the June centerfold. 
Okay, it's not that sexy, really. I'm not naked. But if you'd like to show your love, you can grab one for yourself and one for any true crime fan that you know by going to podcastcalendars.com. Type in the word unicorn to get $5 off a calendar. I'll put that information into the show notes as well. Be sure to go get one. They make great birthday or holiday gifts for that true crime lover in your life. Or a secret Santa gift. Again, that's podcastcalendars.com. All one word, podcastcalendars.com. Unicorn at checkout for $5 off.